everybody to the SMAS WorkSafe hosted webinar on the secret weapon in risk mitigation. Um, here we're going to introduce you to one of our partners, Premier Line, um, who've been a partnership for us with us for many years. And they're going to discuss how the right insurance can help mitigate risks in your business. Uh, my name is Trish Mayer, and I've been working with SMAS WorkSafe for over two years. As the partnership manager, I specialize in SSIP procurement and PAS 91 requirements across various sectors to include construction and facilities management. If you should think of any questions during the presentation, feel free to ask them in the chat box. And at the end of the presentation, we will go through the, the questions. So today our presenters are Duncan Cramphorn and Paul Mills. Duncan is the account director at Premier Line and um, business insurance broker. He has 20 years experience in the industry. Um, the early part of his career was spent as engineering underwriter before moving into brokering in 2004. As one of Premier Line's most experienced account directors, he has clients from the SME and corporate sectors spanning the length and breadth of the UK. Away from work, Duncan is a father of three who's happiest with his nose in a book or his feet in the Lakeland Fells. Paul Mills is the product development manager with Willis Towers Watson Networks. And Paul has 33 years experience in the insurance industry. 22 of them are as an underwriter and 11 on the national brokering side. His main experience is in the property and liability classes, dealing in large accounts for property owners and the construction industry. Paul is a petrol head and a gym addict, and he's married to Liz and has a 23-year-old son called Scott, who has to date managed to avoid working in insurance. Now I will hand over to Duncan and to Paul. Great. Thanks very much, Trish. Uh, thanks for the introduction there. There we go. There's our uh, nice uh, shining faces there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just obviously a few of the objectives from today's uh, webinar. We'll take you through uh, sort of the hard market, the insurance cycle and challenges and how, how to respond to that. And obviously I'll hand off to Paul to uh, sort of take us on through uh, the secret weapon of uh, risk mitigation. So just moving forward. Uh, Insurance, like most things in life, uh, really does tend to go through cycles. Uh, and this basically is a, is a, is a really good overview of, of how that cycle looks. Um, now, where we are at present, I would say if you look to the left there, where you see market capacity being eroded, risk selection rejects and rates rising strongly, that, that's about where we are at this current time. Um, so it's, it, it is tough. So there's obviously how, how do you navigate that? Oh, sorry, here we go. Now, this is how it has been for a good few years now. I'd say at least probably 10, 15 years, if, if not slightly more than that, where we've been in the soft market, uh, which has been great for the insurance buyer as um, you can get more cover for, for, for less money, basically. We had new insurers coming into the market, NGAs, all creating competition. The reinsurer terms for actual insurers were positive and there was loads of capacity in the market. And also over that sort of period, we've seen the rise of e-trade platforms, you know, click and buy, all that kind of thing. Um, so as I say, very, very good conditions for uh, the commercial insurance buyer. So what's changed? Well, <clears throat> To be honest with you, it's it's a combination of, of these things and uh, obviously a few others, but the, these things in the main, uh, without getting too much into the, the, sort of the nitty gritty, as it were, Solvency 2 is effectively, it was a, a condition put on upon insurers, basically they needed to have more capital behind them to protect them against the risks of insolvency. So that means less capacity in the market. 
the changes to the Ogden rate, which is used to calculate the ongoing costs of long-term liability claims or personal injury claims, uh, went up significantly. It did get reduced a little bit, but went up significantly, which basically just means it's costing insurers a lot more money to settle claims. Therefore, they need to reserve more. As we've already alluded to, the pre-2020 property rates were very, very low, and insurers have been clobbered with some, with some big losses claims-wise which again leads in nicely to, uh, I don't know if you remember last year before COVID, that, that there was such a time, believe it or not, uh, that started last year when we had Storms, Dennis and Kira, uh, again, hit the industry to the tune of around 500 million. And then of course, the aforementioned COVID, as, as we all know and uh, are aware of, the, so the cost to the UK industry alone is somewhere in the region of, sort of $4.3 billion, which is just, obviously a staggering amount and I believe it is the, um, the largest ever event to hit the insurance industry as well so it's um, quite seismic in scale um, and as I say that for all the reasons we talked about before the, the costs of reinsurance for insurers are, are now on the rise and as you can see they're up to sort of 40 percent hike uh, even more of that we're seeing in, in some regards and then of course with interest rates being at an all-time low insurers aren't making that sort of return on investment so they're actually having to sort of underwrite for that profit rather than being able to fall back on their investments so it's really to give you that sort of overview of what's going on in the background there it's almost like this perfect storm of bad conditions has come together and is really sort of hitting the market and of course that that's sort of playing through so but you know you're a good, well-run, claims-free business. Why, why should that affect you? What, what impact is, is that going to have on you? Well, to be honest with you, insurers, are, they're, they're reviewing their books now. So even businesses, even particular, some sectors that have run well for you know, years and years, and some businesses who have you know, not had any claims, good, as we say, good, clean, well-run business, uh, and insurers are, are pulling out of that sector. They're just saying it's not it's not one for us anymore. We're going to concentrate our energies elsewhere. So through no fault of your own as a business, just purely due to insurer criteria, the, the cover's not being offered at renewal. So that's that's not helping. Obviously, we've got COVID playing through now as well, with a lot of endorsements coming on. So you'll start seeing those appearing in your policies if you if you haven't already. Additional. Um, as I say, clarifications, maybe or probably more like to be restrictions in cover, to be quite frank. Um, and again, as we say, that real sort of contracting of the industry and contracting of capacity. So, um, and obviously what that means, of course, is that the capacity that is available is coming at a premium. Now, in particular, we're really seeing that play through in the Lloyds market for directors and officers and professional indemnity, uh, which is really being hit. And as well, in addition to the, as I say, though, the not so magnificent seven we just talked about, we've still got that fallout from Grenfell as well, which has really obviously rocked, uh, rocked the PI market in, in that sense. And again, you may find that your, your brokers, um, again, they're, they're facing their own uh, challenges. Again, these, these are things that we're dealing with, we say with increased scrutiny from insurers, that everything has to be absolutely tipped up. We've, we've got to make sure that we're presenting you with as best that we, we ever did. Everyone's got to be on the absolute sort of top of their game. Um, and particularly where, say, we've got insurers maybe increasing premiums on professional indemnity and directors and officers, but actually looking to reduce their limits of indemnity as well. So how do we manage that? How do we look at that? What can we do? What can we work with? What can we live with? Is there a different way of cutting it? And of course, as more and more things move away from the composite markets, as in your Axes, Avivas, Royal Sun Alliance, and goes into the Lloyds market, the Lloyds market is getting squeezed. There's, it's just, it's much, it's, it's taking longer now to get quotations out of the market than it has done for, for quite some time. And of course, um, coming back to COVID-19, we, like any sort of broker, will, we, you know, we are dealing with sort of a, a lot of claims that are sort of go, going through that need to be looked after, uh, need to be looked after, need to be serviced and um, seen through to completion. So against that backdrop, which all sounds very negative, um, how, do you, how do you work through that? What, what's the best path to get through to sort of contain? We, we know there's a bit of pain to come, so how can we sort of minimise that, that pain? And of course, it's working with your broker to make sure that they fully understand your business. As I said before, more than ever, 
now is the time to make sure that your broker absolutely understands what you're doing, what you're about. And for you as a business as well, to look at your own risk management, how, how you're looking at that. Do you have a business continuity plan in place? What measures have you got in place to look after the staff? Because obviously there's a, I won't get into this too much now, it's a little bit outside my sort of area of expertise, but you know, people coming back off furlough, all that kind of thing, if the people that have to be laid off, it's, it's a really difficult time, we appreciate this. So, but if you're managing that well, tell your broker, make sure that's fed back through because it all helps paint a picture of you as a business. And the same with your customer relationships. Again, appreciate that there's a lot of people struggling out there. You're struggling to get sort of payments made, payments back through from customers. How's that working? And again, where you're undertaking all these risk management measures, just like we say in, in law, if it's not written down, it, it didn't happen. So are you, are you keeping adequate records of everything that you're doing? And again, are you making your broker aware that you're doing that? And the same, of, of course, and I say it really is going to sound like a stuck record now, but with all the sort of the COVID guidelines as well, as I see Paul smiling there, but it's something that's just, uh, you, it's, it's very hard to have a conversation these days without involving it. But um, as we all know, there's, there's so much sort of uh, corporate governance and everything else out there in terms of COVID. Are you sticking to those government guidelines? Are you adhering to them? And can you demonstrate that you are? If so, get that over to your broker. I think... I probably would speak for most brokers when I say we would much rather have way too much information about you than not enough. So other points, just slightly more specific, we won't get too much into the science, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to Paul to do that, but just um, a couple of points on, on here, a few areas to look at is look at your business trade and description, because normally on here we, we we would try and encapsulate as many activities as that you're undertaking as possible, which is obviously that that is good practice. But now where everything needs to be absolutely sort of maybe need to sort of start paring down, look at those activities. And if there's high risk things in there that you're not doing anymore and you don't have any plans to, well, maybe we can take those out. Let's, let's take that out of the equation. Let's try and reduce that risk. So it sounds like something very, very simple, but that business description can be really key. So that's worth looking at. Take a look at your sums insured as well. So where your premise is based, all your contents, stock, um, obviously your business interruption figures and everything else. Um, make sure they're up to date. Make sure they're, they're accurate as well. And sometimes in some policies where we're struggling for capacity, maybe we don't need the certain uplift that insurers give. Maybe there's some sort of leeway we can have there to help bring that rate down, help contain that cost. And again, it's the same. We've already touched on sort of indemnity periods and limits of indemnity, but also looking at excess levels as well. If you're looking at the, the excess level on your policy and thinking, well, it's only 250, 500 pounds, I, I could live with more. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm confident I could sort of take a larger hit. Well, well to, to again, speak to your broker about that because, again, that can play through and help with that sort of premium cost in keeping that contained in a, a, a decent level. And, again, make all – I mean, we should be doing this as a, as a matter of course anyway, but always review your sort of your policy terms, the conditions, warranties, and all various other endorsements that are on there to make sure that they're still fit for purpose. There's nothing that's sort of on there that's been on there for years that doesn't need to be there. Uh, is there anything that can be removed? Is there any way of, as I say, just just cutting it, taking a look at your policy and seeing if there's a different way of doing it. But let's say you, a good broker will talk to you about that and suggest different different ways of doing it. We, we, we talk a lot in our business about the art of the doable. If an insurer says, I can't come, if an insurer comes back and says, we can't do that, we'll have that conversation and say, right, well, okay, what can you do? And then obviously come back and have that dialogue with you as a customer and see what we can live with. And of course, for anyone sort of in the sort of that construction industry, you, I'm sure you will have risk assessments and method statements and everything sort of come, coming out your ears. So by all means, let's you know, provide the broker with examples of that as well. You really, this is the time to talk yourselves up and talk about how good a business you are and how well you manage your risk. And equally, if you're able to demonstrate that, and you've got some site photos, say, you know, a site that you're particularly proud of where everything was absolutely, you know, top notch. Please, you know, send those photos in as well. It's all good copy. And coming back to what I was saying earlier, it all helps paint a positive picture of you as a business. It's not just about the numbers. It's about the bigger picture, who you are as a business. 
So by taking that sort of consultative approach and sort of working in collaboration with your broker, I think sometimes there can be a, an opinion that the broker's there to catch you out or anything like that. It really isn't. We're, the broker's role there is to get as much information from you, the business, as possible to, to again, paint that picture back to the insurers. So now is a good time to make sure you've got everything as good as it can possibly be from that sort of risk management perspective. Um, but as I say, it's not just about doing it and have it in, having it in place. It's about demonstrating that you've done that and conveying that message to your broker, who in turn can convey that to the insurer and hopefully help you get the cover you need, but containing the premium for so doing. And I think that's me. Uh, Paul, over to you, sir. Excellent. Thank you, Duncan. Um, I will actually add uh, and reinforce what you've been saying, Duncan, because the, the greatest irony is uh, on what you've uh, spoken about at the moment. We talk about the, uh, the, uh, the, the seven things which insurers have had uh, to deal with. Uh, obviously, they're spending a lot of money um, trying to um, pay claims and that kind of thing. We're always hearing about uh, how they're paying claims. But I'd just like to flip that a little bit and say, yes, there is a lot of claims going through at the moment. Uh, insurers are struggling with that. It's difficult to get a hold of them because they are that busy at the moment. Um, but um, with all of their businesses, they're still a business. They're still not here to automatically pay all of our claims. Um, they're there to uh, do business themselves. So it's difficult sometimes uh, to see an insurer as somebody that is actually running a business and why can't they just pay all my claims? Uh, and they are struggling. Um, if you see them from that perspective, uh, you can then see how uh, getting the detail right in the first place uh, is going to give you a much better chance uh, of actually getting any claims paid because the big issues at the moment are that insurers are looking very closely at their books of business. They're seeing trades that they think, oh, we've, we've had a bit of a bad experience in the past with that trade. We're not going to do that anymore. It's a bit too risky for us. And you'd be surprised at the number of risks that they are looking at to uh, stop quoting for. Um, so you turn that on its head. They've got customers coming through with claims. They're going to take a big view, uh, especially the biggest claims that come in. They're going to put a lot of resource into those claims to make sure that they're not paying out uh, more than they should. Or in some of the worst cases, and you'll see a couple of my um, examples in the next few slides, they will do their damnness to find out a lot more about the business uh, that you have, uh, just in case you've flouted any rules and regulations that they have in their policies with the terms and conditions. And it's very easy for an insurer to turn around and say no to a claim and that's the difficulty we're looking at so um, over the next few minutes we're going to look at three potential business busting true scenarios in the key areas of insurance uh, so we're looking at business interruption we're going to look at cyber risk as well and uh, and then liability which which covers a whole multitude of things to keep you awake um, so uh, we'll we'll look at each area to outline the key risks you really need to be aware of now uh, and some of them as well uh, in 2021 and beyond because um, certainly at the moment we need to keep an eye on every single piece of uh, legislation to run our businesses <clears throat> but as well as that we need to make sure that we're complying with our policy uh, our insurance policies uh, and bearing in mind those are contracts as well so uh, let's get some uh, real life claims examples that uh, that have come across my desk and uh, we can put those risks in perspective to you so one on the left business interruption getting your sums right and this was mentioned by duncan uh we need to get our sums insured right we need to ask you the right questions as brokers uh you need to tell us all the information even though you think oh that's, that's been a bit nosy now well that's what we need to know because uh, there may be a few nuances there which might make a big difference uh to insurance and, and whether you get a claim paid or not so here's an example uh this was only a recent one um came in well recent to me but it came in towards the end of last year so in 2020 there was a fire at ironically a fire door contractors premises um they'd um uh, got their insurance in place uh, was paying several thousand pounds for it they've had it for several years no problems at all everything was great they'd given all the details to their brokers the brokers had popped it over to the insurer um, they'd used the figures that their accountant gave them um, when asked about their gross profit. So uh, the accountant says, well, here it is. It's 400 grand. Um, 
So passed over to the broker, broker passed it over to the insurance company. Um, and because the business as it was, uh, they looked into the time it would take for them to completely rebuild the business. Uh, and it takes a lot longer than you expect folks to have a real good think about your indemnity period. And that is, if it does go bump big time, how long will it take you to get completely back up and running again and commence your business as if nothing had happened? So in this case, they'd quite rightly chosen uh, an indemnity period of 24 months. Uh, there's obviously a lot of complicated machinery there to manufacture their doors. It takes a bit of a while to get it back up and running again. Um, so 24 months, would I suggest 12 months would be a viable figure for most businesses? No, it's going to be more than 12 months. So 24 months, nice little pitch for this company. Fantastic. So then the claim comes in. Um, the insurers uh, got their loss adjusters involved. So they obviously take a very detailed view of the claim, got involved, went to see the client, uh, and then actually looked at it and said, oh, dear, the um, your, your figures show that your actual gross profit uh, for these periods concerned in the period of insurance, uh, it's actually near 2.3 million. So um, why, why have you got 400,000 pounds? So... The problem with this is if you look at some insurers policies, um, you'll be probably a bit frightened to realize that uh, there are little clauses in there to say, well, if you've actually not told us the right information and it's been misleading to us, uh, and there is a thing called the Insurance Act, which says that you should provide all the information to your broker or insurer, uh, and then I should ask more questions about it. Um, well, in this case, um, the wrong figure was given over to the in, to the broker and to the insurer. Nobody queried it. And so the brokers um, had a nasty little uh, discussion with the insurers. Um, and the outset was, you're some insurers incorrect. The insurers then started talking about, well, your sum insured is so low, so incorrect. That smacks, um, you know, did they do it on purpose? So the insurers were actually considering whether not just not pay the claim, but actually say to the insured, well, you've done something really dodgy there. So we're going to cancel your whole policy. Now, in the end, look at the insurer didn't do that. But what they did, and they're well within their rights to do this, they reduced the claim on the basis of the difference in that sum insured. Now, if you see the difference in that sum insured, you'll see it's many multiples less uh, than the actual sum insured they had. Um, and if you look at the 24 month indemnity period, it's not gonna go a long way to bring that business back up and running again. So the simple matter is um, that difference of 400,000 pounds up to 2.3 million pounds in terms of insurance, probably only cost a couple of grand to put right in terms of getting the premium right. But, um, that company is going to really suffer now because they're going to have less than a quarter um, of their uh, payment on that claim to put their business back up and running. Now, luckily, it wasn't a massive claim, but still proportionately, that claims amount is going to be much, much reduced. So that company is going to come up, have to come up with um, a bit more money to, to get their business back up and running again. Not the insurer's fault, possibly not even the broker's fault, uh, but on the face of it, uh, if you use an accountant uh, to give you the gross profit figure, essentially an accountant gross profit figure doesn't include your wage roll. And that was the biggest difference in that figure here. Um, the actual gross profit figure that insurance companies use include the wage roll. Silly little mistake to make. It wasn't the accountant's fault either. But if you're not on the ball enough to realize to get your, your figure across and think, hold on a minute, it would cost me more than 400 grand over two years to get my business up and running again. My turnover is about two and a half million. So those things, be on the ball, make sure your sums insured are right because the insurers can and will uh, kick your claim uh, into the long grass very quickly. Another example of this, uh, not so much under business interruption, um, but I thought this was quite relevant uh, to get your uh, uh, minds thinking about conditions and restrictions that you get in your policy wording. Um, got a nice little excavator there. Um, the contractor themselves went to a third party site and um, thieves uh, he'd done his work for the day, finished. The compound was locked up uh, where the excavator was. 
and uh, it was everything was locked. The excavator was locked up itself, and uh, came back the next day. It was set on fire. Um, there was a lot of damage to the cab, thousands of pounds worth of damage. But um, the irony was that um, when the insurance company started looking into this, um, they said, "Well, no, it wasn't wasn't a proper secured compound um, because." they'd got the wrong fencing in place um, and you hadn't got it guarded properly. And where's, where's the CCTV? So the client had put in, in um, a compound, which invariably um, because the excavator wasn't pinched, they couldn't get it out. So instead they burnt it. So you can see that the compound was obviously fairly robust, but it didn't tie in with the restriction in the policy wording that said you must have, specific fencing you must have at least palisade fencing it must have two security items to it um to each panel to make sure it's not easy to uh, be removed um it should have been at least monitored monitored securely monitored by cctv or had a 24-hour guard in it so again client had done uh, quite a good job of keeping it safe but he hadn't complied 100 percent with the policy wording so be very careful about this very careful as an aside to that i'd say tell everything to your broker as well um i've had a claim since i've written this um, um these slides uh because we had a race course big race course i'm not going to mention which one um but um they had a bit of a problem because upstream uh palace um a um the, the actual, um, oh, I, I suppose the big drainage side of things upstairs, which the council owned, collapsed and the whole lot came down through the tubes underneath the race course, got blocked underneath the race course. And then the race course, obviously, there was nowhere for the water to flow. So it was a big storm that came in. The water, instead of just going through the tubes, went up into the race course and it ended up being two foot underwater. So it took a few days for it to um, go away again. So when they looked at that, they realized that um, the problem was um, that they got to very unlevel ground. Uh, they cost, cost it was costing about £20,000 to fix the damage to the actual race course itself. Um, they lost a lot of business. They've had to shut the race course down. I think they missed about three or four meetings. So upwards, the cost, including their business interruption, uh, was going to be upwards of £250,000, £300,000. But on talking to the insurer about it, the insurers turned around and said, oh, well, we cover your building and, and all of your contents within the building. Um, and we notice your business is a race course. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the policy excludes land. So the insurers have walked away from all of that claim at the moment saying, sorry, we don't we don't insure the actual race course itself. So we're now in a big argument with the insurance company to say, well, we told you it was a race course. You knew it was a race course. You can see the gross profit that we had wasn't just based on the small building with a little bit of a restaurant in. The whole risk was a race course. So essentially we're arguing with the underwriters that the policy wasn't put on the correct basis if it actually excluded the land so you've got to be very careful um you wouldn't have known this as um people with businesses who need to insure them which is why you need a decent broker to actually see beyond your business details be really nosy get all the information but ask you even more questions and then pass it over to insurers and make sure that that cover is on the right basis. So I think this isn't about not getting the correct information over. All the correct information was over on this, but at the other end, when the insurance company gave the policy back to the broker and to the client, I don't think it was on the right basis. So we as brokers also need to be on the ball to make sure it's on the correct basis. Smaller broker wouldn't have known what to do with this, which is I think the case as it is, but uh, the more experienced brokers you have, uh, the more you, you'll obviously be able to rely on them to make sure that the policy is on the correct basis. OK, so moving over now, I'm going to talk about uh, a risk which uh, I'm sure you probably may not have any cover for at the moment, uh, which is uh, cyber. Um, so it's it sounds like a trendy insurance cover to have at the moment, but uh, I'm going to give you a few examples uh, of some claims here. Uh, and just go into a little bit more detail about um, what you need to be worried about from a cyber perspective. Um, some insurance companies, if you've got your commercial insurance, will give you an add-on for that. 
but the add-ons aren't really that good. They're, they're just that, it's just an add-on. So you really need to think about proper cyber covers um, and getting a, a standalone cyber cover for you. Um, and here's some stats for you as well, as opposed to the, the, the stats on the screen are there for you to read. Um, but did you know that 55% of UK email is spam? Um, the most common cyber attack is phishing. So it isn't actually getting hold of your system. It's actually talking to or, or, or just making your employees or, or even yourselves uh, do the right thing and um, expect to pay somebody. And uh, if it gets if your information gets fished and the information goes through, that money's gone straight away. So it literally is uh, you or your employees giving the money away. Uh, albeit electronically so that's the difference in this as well so cyber coverage there to uh, look after you in that uh, perspective um, maybe by businesses email compromise attacks if somebody pretends to be somebody they're not uh, it's as simple as a hacker getting access to an email chain that you've sent uh, jumping in halfway through pretending to be you or one of your customers or your suppliers um, and getting you to redirect the cash to them very scary very easy and that's called cyber crime or social engineering you'll probably hear more about this uh in the press as as more of these attacks go through um and it's it's a shame once that money's gone it's very very hard to get it back again um there's some more stats for you as well 88 percent of uk businesses have suffered breaches in the last 12 months alone um and one sme business uh, that we saw was uh, successfully hacked. Um, one of the SME businesses uh, in the UK is successfully hacked every 19 seconds. So that's a lot of SME businesses just in the UK as well. So obviously, if you do have a cyber attack and it affects one of your customers, uh, you might have a bit of trouble there um, because they probably won't be able to or want to deal with you again. Uh, and they'll certainly stop trading with you until such a time as you've sorted your breach out. So you're losing business there as well. Um, especially as well, some of these cyber attacks, you may have seen it in the news as well. That's uh, a bad bit of social media for you guys as well. If that comes out in the press, uh, you need some really clever uh, assistance on that to make sure that uh, it doesn't uh, put you out of business uh, on, literally by itself on that side. Um, so be careful of your cyber risk. I know that most of you will probably think, well, I'm, I'm not a, an online business. I don't trade electronically 100%, but even uh, for businesses that don't trade electronically that much, you will still use a computer, you will still send emails, um, and you will still be fished by companies to get your details. So you could click on an email link, um, it could lock your entire system out. Um, then all of a sudden you'll get a little email saying, here we go, can you give us a thousand bitcoins please? Um, and you'll not be able to do much about that if you haven't got any cyber cover. Uh, there's even software that gets into your computer somewhere. You only have to click on a link somewhere. So one of your employees does it nonchalantly. Software gets locked into your system. Then they can see every key that you touch at your end. It sends them a log back and then they've got all your nice passwords and uh, codes and they can get into your systems and cause an awful lot of damage or even worse, get into your bank uh, and whip all your money out. Um, so there's, there's a lot of uh, hackers intercepting emails, as I said. They'll produce fake requests. It'll look like your address. It might even look like your supplier's address. One of the digits may be a little bit wrong. They might have a, a dash instead of a, a full stop in there. That's easy to brass over, look over quickly, and then just blast through. So you could lose a lot of money that way for that very simple mistake. So be careful about your cyber risks. Um, there is certainly a lot of uh, different covers um, that you can get for cyber. Um, and I'll, um, I'll, I'll just uh, overview those uh, on one of the next slides. Um, there's a lot of cyber attacks going out there as well at the moment. So be careful. Uh, and it is something maybe to have a word with your brokers about. Um, see, see how much it would cost for you to get uh, cyber cover, because I think it's going to be the new, the new trendy insurance claim to have at the moment. And uh, the lot of, a lot of the backup that you'll get um, from um, the cyber insurance companies, it's not necessarily about them paying a claim. It's about you can phone a friend uh, and they, they even employ uh, some ex-hackers themselves um, to help you um, get your system sorted. So uh, there's a lot of help there 
as well as just having an insurance policy. Uh, and certainly if you can get cover for, as I said, the cyber um, cyber crime, the social engineering cover, um, which isn't necessarily somebody hacking into your system. It's just literally you giving your money away electronically. So be careful of that as well. So talking about uh, liabilities, here's, here's a bit of a claim for you as well. Um, this is another claim that came in, which is going to take an awful long time to deal with. Uh, and we're talking about liability here. Uh, and this is necessarily you doing your job and ticking all the boxes as a business. Uh, you enter into contracts. Um, those contracts have uh, quite a lot of rather large terms in them that you need to be aware of. Um, one of um, our customers um, they actually supplied powdered plastic which was an ingredient in resin board, which was gonna be used in one of those pretty stealth aircraft you can see on the screen. So uh, pretty high tech stuff. Uh, but when they supplied um, the powdered plastic over, uh, it wasn't really good enough. Uh, it came up with a few lumps in it, uh, in the mixture. Uh, and when they produced the board, they noticed all these lumps in and said, well, you know, we can't have a lumpy, uh, a lumpy uh, stealth aircraft. So they went back traced it back to the supplier that did the plastic. Bear in mind, you'll have several customer supplier chains uh, in, in the middle of that. So went back to the person that produced the powdered plastic um, and they went to then the insurance company and said, right, you know, you've got to, you've got to pay for this liability that you have. You didn't supply the right products. You've cocked up all of this amount of, of stealth aircraft parts. The claim itself was about two and a half million pounds. Um, unfortunately, um, Despite the insurer being aware that that's what they did and that's where the parts were going, uh, and the insurer had even put an extension on the policy to say, yes, we will pay for any products issues you have with stealth aircraft, which is a massive exclusion usually, um, the insurer still came back and said, oh, sorry, um, actually, you, you should have had an extension on your policy for the mix, what they call mixing and blending, which is where uh, the powdered product goes into another product. Um, the insurer relied on case law um, and said, well, unfortunately, um, uh, not to go into too much detail, you can Google it afterwards if you like. Um, it's based on a case law called Bacardi, uh, where a mixture went wrong uh, and there was some very nasty benzene ended up in a Bacardi breezer. And uh, when it came to uh, go to court, because everybody was arguing about who owed who what, uh, it was found that when you mix something into another mixture, uh, it changes the way that mixture is, it changes the product. And in fact, um, all of the liability policies that this person relied on uh, was based on damage. Now, the court deemed in Bacardi that damage wasn't caused here because there was no damage done because the product didn't exist in the first place. So that's a very, very big exclusion. It's case law. It's not as if it's standard exclusion under policy. It is a uh, sort of proper legal exclusion, I suppose. So had the uh, broker looked at this in the first place and had an extension on to cover the mixing and blending legal loophole, then that would have been no issue. The cover would have probably cost them about 30 or 40 grand and the claim would have been paid. So you can see the length insurers are going to now to push out these claims. Uh, it would have cost that insurance company, as I said, about two and a half million. Um, is it going to go to court? Don't know. But that one has been rumbling on now for well over a year. So you can see, in fact, it was a year, not last November, it was it was the November before uh, when the broker called me in a panic um, and said the insurance company were taking that action. Very, very difficult to get back from that. And I'm sure as you all know, as soon as uh, another company starts suing you, uh, it's not um, below an insurer to actually turn around and, and uh, get their own legal advice to push back on that claim. So be very, very careful, make sure your broker knows what uh, you are doing and make sure you're telling everything to your broker about the different processes you're involved with and from a liability perspective what contract you're going to be involved with as well so um this is what my um my little top risk uh, risks and tips for 2021 are for you just to give you uh, a summary of what i've just said make sure your estimated gross profit figure includes your wage roll 
Be careful when considering your indemnity period too short and the cover may run out, even though your business hasn't got back up and running again. And of course, with all the things, um, with all the looks through safety management itself, make sure you've got a disaster recovery plan. Keep it safe and up to date. Uh, make sure you can refer to it and write everything down anyway. Contractually, everything needs to be written down. Make sure your broker knows about that as well. Um, and get your customers and suppliers covered as well, because you never know uh, when you're only left with one or two suppliers. Um, if you have a problem on a claim in one of those, you might lose your whole business. So make sure you've got it on the correct basis all the time. So proper risk management, better risk mitigation. Uh, cyber, do you have cyber cover? Uh, the first party cover is the all important first steps to business recovery. That's when you get to call the real um, hackers, ex-hackers who are now helping us out in the industry, they're the ones that know how to get around the back doors of the system onto the dark web uh, and actually help you out to get your business back up and running again. So it's not a claim, it's actually advice and help. Uh, that's first party cover. Third party cover is for your data breach. When everything goes wrong and all your data goes to everybody under the sun, uh, very embarrassing um, if it gets to social media. So you've got third party cover, data breach, defense costs, expenses, fines, damages, because of course we do something wrong as a business these days. There's always somebody in the wings waiting to fine us uh, for what we've done wrong. So be careful with that. If you haven't got any cyber cover, uh, you're going to have a long way to actually uh, do that yourselves and defend yourselves as well. It's certainly legally with solicitors costs at the moment. Amazing. Um, and then what I spoke about, one of the most important ones is the crime cover or social engineering, which is where it's electronic transfer funds when, you, when you're giving your money away. Um, so my advice to you is you can go cheap and cheerful, but you get what you pay for. So get a decent um, cyber policy. Uh, watch out for any sublimits between the policies. They might have what they call aggregated limits. So you might have 250 grand limit each and every claim, but it might be aggregated to 500,000. So you might only get two claims in a year. And once that's run out, it's run out. So be careful about that as well. And social engineering cover produces a large percentage of claims as well. So uh, that, that's why I wanted to mention that to you today. Uh, so on the liability side of things as well, um, I could probably talk about this for another four or five hours. Uh, EL insurance, you know what employers liability insurance is. It is compulsory. But as Duncan said at the start of this, make sure you've got your uh, checks uh, and all, all your, your proper procedures in place. Make sure they're written down, uh, because if those HSE inspectors pop around, one, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Two, you might get a massive fine and that will be mitigated um, if you can actually show them your robust procedures, your risk management expertise and how well you manage your own risks as well. Uh, public products, where we're talking about products liability, where we're talking about airplane uh, parts that we just spoke about. No, it's not compulsory, but you can see by that example, uh, it's definitely needed. Make sure you've got public products liability. Minimum indemnity limits are 2 million. You might need a bit more than that in this day and age, certainly with uh, defense costs coming up as well. Uh, 2 million, 5 million or 10 million may be required to enter into some contracts. Even the council's indemnity limits sometimes may be at least 10 million uh, before you get to join on that contract. Um, and while we're talking about contracts, be aware of contractual liabilities, of course. I know we're not all solicitors, but we do need to have a little bit of an idea what's going on with our contracts that we agree into. Even under standard JCT contracts, be aware of some of the conditions that are in there. Always have a read of the small print. Yes, get legal advice, uh, but it's worth just knowing yourself um, what you're actually uh, signing that paper for. It might be the, the golden contract of your whole business life. It might be the best thing ever. But if you've signed your life away under that contract, something goes wrong, the business will have gone. So be careful on contractual liabilities mm. as well. Uh, and consider... Uh, directors and officers insurance, which will, of course, um, we talk, We used to talk about limited companies keeping directors safe. Uh, if anything went bump, no problem at all. Um, you're a limited company, it limits the liability. Well, things are a bit different than that now. Uh, there are ways to get around that. And uh, the, the director's uh, possessions themselves aren't safe from that. So you can get directors and officers insurance. And with all things for professionals, like all of us in these day and age, we do something wrong, we can get sued for it. So make sure you get professional indemnity cover as well, just in case. Brokers need it too. We all need to be professional with it. If we do something wrong, 
you're going to expect us to actually put you in the same position um, if, if there's any problems at all. So we need our professional indemnity cover too. Management liability, if you've got problems with your employees, stuff like that. Um, you need to follow those procedures very carefully. You can insure for that as well to get support from an insurer to plug any liability gaps. So again, proper risk management, better risk mitigation but make sure you've got a professional broker in it who can actually help you go through uh, and make the right decisions and uh, give you the best advice so there's a summary of uh, what i've just come up with as well and uh, i'm hoping uh, this will have hit the right mark with you today there's a lot of information to talk around i hope i haven't skipped over um, any details on that as i say it's very detailed but i just wanted to give you an overall process of some of the issues that you might have with some claims uh, and certainly if you if you walk into these things blind uh, the business will fall away very very quickly so it's best to be uh, making sure you've ticked all your boxes um, making sure you've you've involved the um, uh, an, uh, an expert broker to actually manage those risks with you and to give you some sound advice on that. Otherwise, you may find yourselves uh, in a bit of a deep hole and costing a lot more than you wish to spend in your business. So um, that's me finished. I hope that's OK. I shall uh, now pass back to Trish and we'll see if you've got any questions today. Right. Thank you very much, Paul and Duncan. Um, that was really uh, a great insight into, into your world, really. Um, you know, there's so many aspects that we, we don't think offhand, such as the cyber and um, also various examples that you gave us firsthand. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, it just goes to show you, know, you, you have to have your, your management processes in place, you know, just tying it to your, the, the legal requirements in terms of health and safety, um, and your PAS 91 requirements, which then ties back into insurance. So, you know, for, for any assistance, don't forget to, to get hold of us or, you know, for any advice. Um, we don't seem to have any questions that have come through on the chat, but I had, okay, so I've got one here from Steph, um, she says, my broker says it's counterproductive to have more than two to three people involved in my renewal. Is that true? Uh, I'll, I'll take that on, uh, Trish. Yeah, thanks for the question, Steph. Um, yes, yes and no. I mean, I think it, it really depends on, say, the, the nature of your business and the, uh, the, the, the nature of your policy as well in regards to sort of the uh, the complexity of it. Um, I'd say if you have sort of got a quite a complex need, you may sometimes be better just picking one broker to to, to run with it uh, and go and test the market. Uh, and certainly, at, at a push, obviously, maybe select a, what, what, maybe one other to sort of run counter to that. But I think if you start getting up to sort of three or more brokers, you really can it, it can be counterproductive, mm -hmm. um, particularly if you're going into Lloyd's. And you've got the underwriter sort of seeing the same presentation several times over from uh, from different brokers and they're all slightly different it can be off-putting to them so I, i'll be honest with you probably tend to say for the most part if you've got one that you're happy with pick them and run with that if not add a push to say bring another one in to uh, to sort of counter that oh thank you Duncan. Okay. another question that that i have is um, how long does it take, do you think it's going to take the insurance industry um, to get through the hard market as oh. you discuss? <laughs> uh, to be honest, do you want me to grab this one? Because um, this, this is something that's uh, quite close to my heart because um, there was uh, the, the big issues with all of this uh, and at the very start of this webinar, uh, Duncan put up, uh, seven different things which has made the insurance companies uh, bite their lips. Uh, we all thought um, this hard market was going to be a lot harder, a lot faster than it has been, uh, and it hasn't so far. Um, the reason for that, the reason the sting's been taken out of the tail, and when I, when I mean sting is, I mean that I think most people expected all of the policies to go up 30% or so, 
um, because everybody was getting rattled by the market and COVID and the increased costs and all the things that we mentioned earlier. Um, but the, the, the good benefit of this is, is that whilst um, the, the standard insurers have been around uh, biting their lips on it and waiting to jump, they did jump quite a bit early um, because we were all waiting for uh, things to kick off. They didn't because um, what they call capacity of the market, that's, that's the amount of money that's available from companies um, to invest, it, for instance, in the Lloyds market to actually put forward uh, the capacity for underwriters to write the business. Um, there's a lot more capacity in the market than everybody expected. And, and there's a lot of um, um, different insurance groups, uh, which we call MGAs, which have been cropping up, which can provide uh, some of the risk covers that some of the other insurers had pulled out on in the last year. Mm. So rather than being a big drop in the market and a lot of costs going up, uh, there's a lot more actors involved at the moment. So there's a lot more for us brokers. Uh, there are a lot more markets for us brokers to talk to. So I think that's keeping the hard market down a bit. Um, how long this will take? Um, I, th I think it's going to lessen off in probably one or two years. But as it hasn't been as bad as we thought, um, I think that the main difference here, the main problem with the market is is that some of the trades that are perceived high risk now uh from imagine care homes and that kind of thing and obviously um grenfell tower uh you've got a lot of issues with the contractors who put the cladding on um rather than insurers just banging all the premiums up they're being very selective on the markets they're looking at and as duncan said earlier lloyd's uh undertook uh, a year or so ago actually to actually look at their business book and and root out the risks that they didn't want to do so rather than the insurance hard market going up in terms of premium it's more in terms of the higher perceived risks uh, and those those have been the difference and that's why the mgas have come in and probably helped it out not being as bad as it could have been okay interesting thank you another question that um that has come through is can you give us an estimate of what a basic cyber insurance policy cost would be? <laughs> Sorry, Paul, go on. Now, what, what I'm going to say on that is it, um, and this is this is hopefully an answer you don't hear a lot uh, from when you're talking to insurers, but it really does depend. Um, and it depends on how the actual insurance is rated, the uh, size of your business. Uh, some insurers rate it on the number of employees you've got. Some rate it on turnovers. Um, but um, invariably, I, I would be surprised if, if you're, a, you're a, an SME business, you could start at the ground up. You can get some policies for a couple of hundred quid. Won't have all the bells and whistles in, um, but a similar similar policy for your business um, based on one of the insurers that does provide all of the extras that I'm talking about and bear in mind I'm talking about mainly sort of social engineering cover it does cost a couple of thousand pounds to actually get that kind of cover just for an SME business and I'm talking that the the sort of maybe through the medium size of it at the moment so it is a costly insurance to buy purely on the basis that there's a lot behind it and there's a lot of uh, expenditure going in certainly to provide the uh, the hackers um, to to actually help your business out. So it really does depend. It depends if you want an entry level policy. Uh, it depends if you want one with all the bells and whistles in. There are probably about nine or ten insurers uh, who who we could probably reel off to say, well, these guys are worth uh, approaching. But in all of these, um, I, I would I would defer to the experience. Uh, of your broker in the market that they look at as well uh, and they'll be able to uh, source out uh, the minimum covers for you um, and let you know what you're paying for really and I think that's that's the difference don't just go for the cheapest chips and expect it to cover you all it's really asking the question and seeing actually what it would cost um, to actually get you the decent stuff against just an off the wall quick quickie policy which might only cost a few hundred quid um, might be good enough for you it might be exactly what you need and again with all of these things in insurance it's not a black and white thing it's, it's something that needs to be managed and if your broker doesn't understand how to place that business then that's more of a problem for you so uh, get in touch with your broker and ask and get the advice from them 
Duncan, yeah, do you want to add anything to that? No, I, I, I completely agree. But I was, I was going to say, say in terms of sort of um, you know starting, I was going to say similar thing, somewhere between sort of 200, 250 pounds at that sort of bottom level, and then yeah, depending on how far you want to take the cover, it really can run in, run into the thousands. I think uh, again, as Paul said, there's different rateable factors. A lot, a lot of it as well for larger businesses. It can be, um, you know, uh, how many records are you even keeping hold of as well can be a factor as well. So it's, uh, yeah, it really is dependent on the the, the, the business itself and the, its, its specific needs. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for, for answering those questions and mm -hmm. for your, your, you know, your insight into the industry. Um, they don't seem any more questions um, so I would like to thank everybody for attending the webinar if you would like to recap any of the slides uh, we will be sending you a link so that you can download your own copy of the presentation and if you have any other questions um, the contact details are available on the presentation or you're welcome to give me a, co a, a ring and I can put you through, uh, put you on to the uh, to Duncan or to Paul. Um, so once again, thank you very much, and I hope you all have a lovely weekend. Thanks, Trish. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.